This morning's reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 1 through to 20, and can be found on page 1176 in the Church Bibles. So it's Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient, therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Um, And as Peter said, my name's Ruth Stokes. I've been part of the congregation here for about 12 years, and I got the easy text. (laughs) Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you love us so much. Please, will you speak to us and encourage us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, sounds very loud. Um, Last week, Joe Logan helpfully explained the do's and don'ts of Ephesians 4 in the context of Paul encouraging the Christian community to be transformed as a response to the love and forgiveness of God. Aaron showed the artist Stormzy singing Blinded by Your Grace, part two, and spoke about the call to live a holy life whilst facing the daily realities of our own brokenness. And that is something I'm very well aware of as I stand up here to speak this message. So, oh, it's up already. Um, So this week, we're going to look at the call to live a holy life in the context of us being children of God, part of God's family, which is how this chapter begins. So this is one of the We Do Family posters. I don't know if you've seen them. Um, Just have a little look, maybe pick one, have a scan. So I first saw one of these uh, in a friend's house, I think it was about a year ago, and I was really struck by the explicit way it laid out the guidelines their family was to live by. They're very real. I love the fact it includes messy, because (laughs) as my kids would tell me, uh, and probably my husband, uh, being tidy is something I'm working on. But it also includes sorry, and second chances. The values you want your family to live by are displayed for all to see. A reminder of what it means to be part of your family. Okay, can we blank that off? Okay, 
So, many commentators think that verses 1 and 2, which calls us to imitate God as his children, should actually be at the end of chapter 4. And of course, they also fit there. But I think it's really helpful that chapter 5 starts like this, because the passage is bookended and it's sprinkled with positive statements on what it means to be part of God's family. So the instructions on what we should not be doing are the converse of the things we should be doing, just as if those We Do Family posters had the opposite included, e.g., we don't give up straight away, we don't hold grudges. So rather than seeing this passage as a list of things people shouldn't do, I think it's sort of helpful to see it as Paul giving us advice on what doesn't fit if we're to live as children of God a family which is to be distinctive in being one that loves and brings light. So, who are we? So a lot of the book of Ephesians is about being called and chosen by God to be adopted into his family as his children. Now, I have children, and I love them a lot. I treasure them. I'm committed to them. I spend a lot of time with them. I try my best to listen to them. I share what I have with them. And I'm just a normal human mum. And all this and more God does for us. He calls us not only to know him and to know his love, but to show his love and his light to the world in the hope that they too can become part of his family. And as part of that, we are called to imitate Jesus, a small task, and not only called children of light, but in verse 8, we're actually called light. If we are followers of Jesus, God graciously pours himself into us by his Holy Spirit so that we can carry Jesus, the light of the world around in us. God himself lives in us if we will let him. So what are some of the, dis- the distinctive characteristics of this family of God? Well, lots of these have been dealt with in the past few weeks. Humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love. But in this section, Paul is specifically speaking about purity And this was no less tricky an issue to write to the Ephesians about than it is for us today in our society that I think it's fair to say is fairly obsessed with sex. Sex is seen as one of, if not the most important thing in life. And I recently heard YouTuber YouTuber Daniel Howe say, sex, close brackets, is the foundation of life. And therefore, to be seen to be restricting sex is seen to be restricting life. But Paul is not about ruining people's fun. Paul says that sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking are, and I quote, improper and out of place for God's holy people. Holy means set apart. It's distinctive. It's sacred. It's not the same as all the rest. It's special. If these things are what some of the world is doing, Paul says the Ephesian church are called to be different. Paul describes the fruit of light, a life lived in the light as goodness, righteousness, and truth, characteristics of God himself. And as Joe and Aaron said last week, This is about a life we're aiming for, maybe a journey we're on, even though we haven't completely arrived. This is for our sake, but it also affects God. In Ephesians 4, verse 30, just before where this starts, Paul instructs us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. This is a crazy thought. When we do things God's told us not to do, The Holy Spirit within us is actually grieved. 
We can make God sad by our actions. Why is he sad? Well, in verse 12, firstly, we're called to be obedient. Jesus said in John 14 that if we love him, we will obey his commands. But why would he be bothered if we obey? Well, point two, if if you like, we can see God's way as a safe place of love in which we live. And when we decide to do things our own way, it's usually us or others who get hurt. I heard someone saying that fire only burns you when you put your hand in it. And it's similar, I think, with God's guidelines for life. It's us who get burnt when we break them. There is always forgiveness and grace. But God does not want his creation to be hurt. He loves us too much. And I think if we are honest, then we can see this. Even though we would perhaps prefer everything was fine if we lived exactly as we wanted. Or maybe that's just me. It's also interesting that Paul follows the list of immorality, impurity, and greed by saying that living like this is idolatry, which means putting something else before God. And in a straight-talking sort of way, this means we think something else is more important than God. But isn't Paul being a bit extreme and earnest, and maybe he should lighten up a bit? We might look at this and maybe we'd think, well, fair enough for sexual immorality. We might see this as a biggish thing. And maybe we are more grieved or maybe we're more shocked if we hear of a Christian leader, especially a prominent one, who's perhaps had an affair. Maybe we're more shocked than if that person hadn't professed a faith and we hope the Christian would be different. But what about coarse joking? What about some of that stuff at Live of the Apollo? It seems a bit over the top to say it's out of place, a bit puritanical. Though can I just mention at this point that apparently the Puritans were very much in favour of passionate sex within marriage, and I think they may get falsely criticised on that score. Paul's question is, do these things fit with the values of God's family? Are they bringing goodness, righteousness and truth Is what is said honouring to women and men? Is it kind? Does it help us follow Jesus and be more full of him and his abundant life so that we can live in a distinctive way? I agree with Joe Logan who spoke last week. This passage is not supposed to be a list of right and wrongs or something where you get more points, you know, if you get things right. In chapter 3, verse 19, Paul prays that the Ephesians may know God's love and be filled up with God himself. We are called to partner with all that is good in order that we may know more of the fullness of God and his love living in us. Paul seems to suggest that we cannot partner with the things we've been told not to do and expect the same result. The two just don't work. Like, I don't know, trying to make roast beef and Yorkshire pudding with corned beef and no oven. You just will not get the same result. How then can we live to show we're part of God's family? Well, as human beings, we all have basic needs, food, water, shelter. But we also have strong desires for physical contact, for sexual intimacy, for fun, for relationship, for significance? Are we supposed to just turn them off? Of course not. And I think this passage indicates a number of ways forward. Firstly, Paul is wonderfully practical. And he says in verse 4 that the antidote to greed and impurity or flip and talk about sex is gracious thanksgiving, being grateful. I wonder if you've heard of the gratitude movement It's becoming more and more popular since research has shown that spending time being grateful increases the well-being and health of the individual and reduces the need for exploitation as people feel there's enough. I don't need to grab more. 
And it may not surprise you to find that one of the founders was actually a Benedictine monk, well, he is a Benedictine monk, um, who began writing about gratitude as a pathway to prayer. Being thankful goes against consumerism and greed in all its forms. And this in itself is distinctive in our culture. The world is full of wonderful things we can enjoy. James 1 verse 17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Perhaps we can start by being thankful for what God has already given us. Friends, homes, spouses, perhaps even for someone's beauty without wanting it for ourselves. In the paraphrased words of the designer Vivian Westwood's husband, Andreas Kronthaler, I hope I pronounced it right, we can be thankful that such a thing exists without feeling the need we must own it. And that is something I should probably apply when clothes shopping. The second thing Paul seems to focus on is time. Be wise. Make the most of every opportunity. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Paul describes the deeds of darkness as fruitless. They don't sow for eternity and could perhaps therefore be seen as a waste of time. I don't know if, like me, you feel you often don't have enough time. But again, I wonder here if a key is being thankful for the time we've got and asking God's direction in how we can use it. I think generally people want to make the most of their lives. And here, Paul is giving another pointer towards how we might do this and be distinctive. It might seem strange to suggest to suggest that our time and our lives are not ours alone. But here, Paul suggests we need to ask God for wisdom in how to use our days, as if our priorities are different. At this point, we might be thinking, this is a bit much. And then comes the final straw, the much-quoted and half-quoted verse, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Now, there are many occasions in the Bible where wine was consumed. So what can Paul mean? Well, drunk means different things to different people. And I was once with someone who, uh, who hadn't actually drunk anything and just worried to me, an elderly person, if she thought she might be drunk. And I had to reassure her I didn't think uh, that that had happened. So it means different things to different people. But in this context, I think Paul seems to be saying that things might end up happening that might not otherwise have happened. And as some translations have dissipation instead of debauchery, the focus may be on waste. That's more the meaning of dissipation, waste of time, waste of ourselves. And perhaps the key question is, what influence are we under? And maybe this applies to much of the passage because Paul's point is, there is something much better. Well, I said earlier that this was not a list of right and wrongs, but so far it might seem like it. But here I am going to bring in C.S. Lewis to help me out, and I love this quote. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because they cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. What God has on offer is better. Yes, really. And this brings us to the second half of the statement on not being drunk. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. All this thankfulness stuff only works if God himself is enough. Being filled with the Spirit is not a boring substitute for uh, quite a lot of strawberry gin or real ale. I personally like Rioja. 
I have to point out that when the Holy Spirit first came on the disciples at Pentecost, they were accused of being drunk. A big part of it, of course, may have been that they were babbling in different languages. Obviously, they were understood. But I also think they must have looked pretty happy. And one of the fruits of the Spirit, the result of the Spirit in us, is joy, which is why C.S. Lewis says, infinite joy is offered us. God is the source of joy. C.S. Lewis's book about his journey to faith is called Surprised by Joy. And it is this joy that far surpasses being drunk. I think that's what Paul is saying. For me, I love being carried up in extended times of worship. But the Holy Spirit also brings joy when we praise God in difficult situations. He brings hope when all appears to be lost. And he can bring a peace that is beyond understanding, a still small voice that we hear when we're quiet. I humbly suggest that to know God's love and joy, to live lives that are distinctive, we need to be more full of the Spirit, more satisfied with God himself. Otherwise, we may go looking elsewhere for something to excite and satisfy us, something that in the long run is no substitute for God. One of the American students who was here in half term spoke of his joy in discovering that God is a mystery. But he's a mystery, hidden as it were, so that we have joy in finding him. A glorious, holy hide and seek, if you like. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. And that is a promise he will keep. And we will not be disappointed. So, as Paul suggests, let's sing songs, turn on the radio or a CD, and allow our hearts to be lifted as we remember who God is. Amy Carmichael was an early 20th century missionary in India, and in her comment on this passage, she said, Never be afraid of singing too much. And the 1956 Tyndale commentary said there should be exhilaration in song and praise, which I really liked. And let's also take a moment to be quiet with God and to learn to enjoy what Viktor Petrenko, who was here a few weeks ago, called fellowship with Jesus. There's nothing sweeter. Let's read a verse of scripture, encourage one another with one, and ask God to fill us with his spirit. And let's make it our aim, as verse 20 said, and Peter read, to always give thanks to God for everything. And I know there's another complete sermon just in that verse. But Paul's point here is that if we give thanks to God, we also begin to see he is enough. We may already be doing all this. But the glorious thing is there is always more of God and his love. So we've seen that we're God's children. We're part of God's family who are called to live in a distinctive way to show God's light and love. And all this is only possible as we live full of his wonderful Holy Spirit. The bar may seem to be set very high and the calling though it is wonderful is not easy but our heavenly father knows our weaknesses he knows we're sometimes pretty weak and feeble and he's more than able and willing to help us if we ask i'm going to end with a prayer which i've adapted from the anglican daily prayer father god let's pray Father God, renew us, your broken people, with your Holy Spirit, that we may walk the narrow way. Bear us on the holy wings of your Spirit to the stronghold, the safe place of your love, your joy, and your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.